Track Two, The Woman in White. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Woman in White by Wilkie Collins, read by Tim Bulkley, of BigBible.org. Track Two, The First Epoch, Five. She has escaped from my asylum. I cannot say with truth that the terrible inference which those words suggested flashed upon me like a new revelation. Some of the strange questions put to me by the woman in white, after my ill-considered promise to leave her free to act as she pleased, had suggested the conclusion either that she was naturally flighty and unsettled, or that some recent shock of terror had disturbed the balance of her faculties. But the idea of absolute insanity which we all associate with the very name of an asylum, had, I can honestly declare, never occurred to me in connection with her. I had seen nothing in her language or her actions to justify it at the time, and even with the new light thrown on her by the words which the stranger had addressed to the policeman, I could see nothing to justify it now. What had I done? Assisted the victim of the most horrible of all false imprisonments to escape, or cast loose on the wide world of London an unfortunate creature whose actions it was my duty and every man's duty mercifully to control. I turned, sick at heart when the question occurred to me, and when I felt self-reproachfully that it was asked too late. In the disturbed state of my mind it was useless to think of going to bed, when I at last got back to my chambers in Clement's Inn. Before many hours elapsed it would be necessary to start on my journey to Cumberland. I sat down, and tried, first to sketch, then to read. But the woman in white got between me and my pencil, between me and my book. Had the forlorn creature come to any harm? That was my first thought, though I shrank selfishly from confronting it. Other thoughts followed, on which it was less harrowing to dwell. Where had she stopped the cab? What had become of her now? Had she been traced and captured by the men in the chaise? Or was she still capable of controlling her own actions, and were we two following our widely parted roads towards one point in the mysterious future, at which we were to meet once more? It was a relief when the hour came to lock my door, to bid farewell to London pursuits, London pupils, and London friends, and to be in movement again, towards new interests and a new life. Even the bustle and confusion at the railway terminus, so wearisome and bewildering at other times, roused me and did me good. My travelling instructions directed me to go to Carlisle, and then to diverge by a branch railway which ran in the direction of the coast. As a misfortune to begin with, our engine broke down between Lancaster and Carlisle. The delay occasioned by this accident caused me to be too late for the branch train, by which I was to have gone on immediately. I had to wait some hours and when a later train finally deposited me at the nearest station to Limeridge House, it was past ten, and the night was so dark that I could hardly see my way to the pony chaise which Mr. Fairley had ordered to be waiting for me. The driver was evidently discomposed by the lateness of my arrival. He was in that state of highly respectful sulkiness which is peculiar to English servants. We drove away slowly through the darkness in perfect silence. The roads were bad and the dense obscurity of the night increased the difficulty of getting over the ground quickly. It was, by my watch, nearly an hour and a half from the time of our leaving the station, before I heard the sound of the sea in the distance, and the crunch of our wheels on a smooth gravel drive. We had passed one gate before entering the drive, and we passed another before we drew up at the house. I was received by a solemn manservant out of livery, was informed that the family had retired for the night and was then led to a large and lofty room where my supper was awaiting me, in a forlorn manner, at one extremity of a lonesome mahogany wilderness of a dining-table. I was too tired and out of spirits to eat or drink much, especially with the solemn servant, waiting on me as elaborately as if a small dinner-party had arrived at the house instead of a solitary man. In a quarter of an hour I was ready to be taken up to my bedchamber. The solemn servant conducted me into a prettily furnished room, and said, "'Breakfast at nine o'clock, sir,' looked all around him to see that everything was in its proper place, and noiselessly withdrew. 
What shall I see in my dreams tonight? I thought to myself, as I put out the candle. The woman in white? Or the unknown inhabitants of this Cumberland mansion? It was a strange sensation to be sleeping in the house, like a friend of the family, and yet not to know one of the inmates, even by sight. Six. When I arose the next morning and drew my blind, the sea opened before me joyously under the broad August sunlight, and the distant coast of Scotland fringed the horizon with its lines of melting blue. The view was such a surprise, and such a change to me, after my weary London experience of brick and mortar landscape, that I seemed to burst into a new life and a new set of thoughts the moment I looked at it. A confused sensation of having suddenly lost my familiarity with the past, without acquiring any additional clearness of idea in reference to the present or the future, took possession of my mind. Circumstances that were but a few days old faded back in my memory, as if they had happened months and months since. Pesca's quaint announcement of the means by which she had produced me my present employment, the farewell evening I had passed with my mother and sister, even my mysterious adventure on the way home from Hampstead, all had become like events which might have occurred in some former epoch of my existence. Although the woman in white was still in my mind, the image of her seemed to have grown dull and faint already. A little before nine o'clock I descended to the ground floor of the house. The solemn man-servant of the night before met me wandering along the passages, and compassionately showed me the way to the breakfast-room. My first glance around me, as the man opened the door, disclosed a well-furnished breakfast-table standing in the middle of a long room with many windows in it. I looked from the table to the window furthest from me, and saw a lady standing at it, with her back turned toward me. The instant my eyes rested on her I was struck by the rare beauty of her form, and by the unaffected grace of her attitude. Her figure was tall, yet not too tall, comely and well-developed, yet not fat. Her head set on her shoulders with an easy, pliant firmness. Her waist, perfection in the eyes of a man, for it occupied its natural place, it filled out its natural circle. It was visible and delightfully undeformed by stays. She had not heard my entrance into the room, and I allowed myself the luxury of admiring her for a few moments, before I moved one of the chairs near me, as the least embarrassing means of attracting her attention. She turned towards me immediately. The easy elegance of every movement of her limbs and body, as soon as she began to advance from the far end of the room, set me in a flutter of expectation to see her face clearly. She left the window, and I said to myself, The lady is dark. She moved forward a few steps, and I said to myself, The lady is young. She approached nearer, and I said to myself, with a sense of surprise which words fail me to express, The lady is ugly. Never was the old conventional maxim that nature cannot err more flatly contradicted. Never was the fair promise of a lovely figure more strangely and startlingly belied by the face and head that crowned it. The lady's complexion was almost swarthy and dark down on her upper lip was almost a moustache. She had a large, firm, masculine mouth and jaw, prominent, piercing, resolute brown eyes, and thick, coal-black hair, growing unusually low down on her forehead. Her expression, bright, frank, and intelligent, appealed, while she was silent, to be altogether wanting in those feminine attractions of gentleness and pliability, without which the beauty of the handsomest woman alive is beauty incomplete. To see such a face as this, set on shoulders that a sculptor would have longed to model, to be charmed by the modest graces of action through which the symmetrical limbs betrayed their beauty when they moved, and then to be almost repelled by the masculine form and masculine look of the features in which the perfectly shaped figure ended, was to feel a sensation oddly akin to the helpless discomfort familiar to us all in sleep when we recognize, yet cannot reconcile, the anomalies and contradictions of a dream. "'Mr. Hartwright,' said the lady, interrogatively, her dark face lighting up with a smile, and softening and growing womanly the moment she began to speak. "'We resigned all hope of you last night, and went to bed as usual. Accept my apologies for our apparent want of attention, 
and allow me to introduce myself as one of your pupils. Shall we shake hands? I suppose we must come to it sooner or later, and why not sooner? These odd words of welcome were spoken in a clear, ringing, pleasant voice. The offered hand, rather large but beautifully formed, was given to me with the easy, unaffected self-reliance of a highly bred woman. We sat down together at the breakfast table in as cordial and customary a manner as if we had known each other for years, and had met at Limeridge House to talk over old times by previous appointment. "'I hope you come here good-humouredly determined to make the best of your position,' continued the lady. "'You will have to begin this morning by putting up with no other company at breakfast than mine. My sister is in her own room, nursing that essentially feminine malady, a slight headache. And her old governess, Mrs. Vasey, is charitably attending on her with restorative tea. My uncle, Mr. Fairley, never joins us at any of our meals. He is an invalid, and keeps bachelor state in his own apartments. There is no one else in the house but me. Two young ladies have been staying here, but they went away yesterday in despair, and no wonder. All through their visit, in consequence of Mr. Fairley's invalid condition, we produced no such convenience in the house as a flirtable, danceable, small-talkable creature of the male sex. And the consequence was, we did nothing but quarrel, especially at dinner-time. How can you expect four women to dine together alone every day and not quarrel? We are such fools. We can't entertain each other at table. You see, I don't think much of my own sex, Mr. Hartwright. Which will you have? Tea or coffee? No woman does think much of her own sex, though few of them confess it as freely as I do. Dear me, you look puzzled. Why, are you wondering what you will have for breakfast, or are you surprised at my careless way of talking? In the first case, I advise you as a friend to have nothing to do with that cold ham at your elbow, and to wait until the omelette comes in. In the second case, I will give you some tea to compose your spirits, and do all a woman can, which is very little, by the by, to hold my tongue." She handed me my cup of tea, laughing gaily. Her light flow of talk and her lively familiarity of manner with a total stranger were accompanied by an unaffected naturalness and an easy inborn confidence in herself and her position, which would have secured her the respect of the most audacious man breathing. While it was impossible to be formal and reserved in her company, it was more than impossible to take the faintest vestige of a liberty with her, even in thought. I felt this instinctively, even while I caught the infection of her own bright gaiety of spirits, even while I did my best to answer her in her own frank, lively way. "'Yes, yes,' she said, when I had suggested the only explanation I could offer to account for my perplexed looks. "'I understand you're such a perfect stranger in the house that you're puzzled by my familiar references to the worthy inhabitants. Natural enough. I ought to have thought of it before.' At any rate, I can set it right now. Suppose I begin with myself, so as to get done with that part of the subject as soon as possible. My name is Marian Halcombe, and I am as inaccurate as women usually are in calling Mr. Fairley my uncle, and Miss Fairley my sister. My mother was twice married, the first time to Mr. Halcombe, my father, the second time to Mr. Fairley, my half-sister's father. Except that we're both orphans, we are in every respect as unlike each other as possible. My father was a poor man, and Miss Fairley's father was a rich man. I have got nothing, and she has a fortune. I am dark and ugly, and she is fair and pretty. Everybody thinks me crabbed and odd, with perfect justice. And everybody thinks her sweet-tempered and charming, with more justice still. In short, she is an angel, and I am... Try some of that marmalade, Mr. Hartwright, and finish the sentence, in the name of female propriety, for yourself. What am I to tell you about Mr. Fairley? Upon my honour I hardly know. He is sure to send for you after breakfast, and you can study him for yourself. In the meantime, may I inform you, first, that he is the late Mr. Fairley's younger brother, secondly, that he is a single man, and thirdly, that he is Miss Fairley's guardian. I won't live without her, and she can't live without me, and that is how I come to be at Limeridge House. My sister and I are honestly fond of each other, which, you will say, is perfectly unaccountable under the circumstances, and I quite agree with you, but so it is. You must please both of us, Mr. Hartwright, or please neither of us. And what is still more trying, you will be thrown entirely upon our society. 
Mrs. Vesey is an excellent person who possesses all the cardinal virtues, and counts for nothing. Mr. Fairley is too great an invalid to be a companion for anybody. I don't know what is the matter with him, and the doctors don't know what is the matter with him, and he doesn't know himself what is the matter with him. We all say it's on the nerves, and we none of us know what we mean when we say it. However, I advise you to humour his little peculiarities when you see him to-day. Admire his collection of coins, prints, and watercolour drawings, and you will win his heart. Upon my word, if you can be contented with a quiet country life, I don't see why you should not get on very well here. From breakfast to lunch Mr. Fairley's drawings will occupy you. After lunch Miss Fairley and I shoulder our sketch-books and go out to misrepresent nature under your directions. Drawing is her favourite whim, mind, not mine. Women can't draw. Their minds are too flighty. Their eyes are too inattentive. No matter. My sister likes it. And so I waste paint and spoil paper for her sake, as composedly as any woman in England. As for the evenings, I think we can help you through them. Miss Fairley plays delightfully. For my own poor part, I don't know one note of music from the other. But I can match you at chess, backgammon, escarte, and with the inevitable female drawbacks, even at billiards as well. What do you think of the programme? Can you reconcile yourself to our quiet, regular life? Or do you mean to be restless and secretly thirst for change and adventure in the humdrum atmosphere of Limeridge House? She had run on thus far, in her graceful, bantering way, with no other interruptions on my part than the unimportant replies which politeness required of me. The turn of the expression, however, in her last question, or rather the one chance word, adventure, lightly as it fell from her lips, recalled my thoughts to my meeting with the woman in white, and urged me to discover the connection which the stranger's own reference to Mrs. Fairley informed me must once have existed between the nameless fugitive from the asylum and the former mistress of Limeridge House. Even if I were the most restless of mankind, I said, I should be in no danger of thirsting after adventures for some time to come. The very night before I arrived at this house I met with an adventure. And the wonder and excitement of it, I can assure you, Miss Halcombe, will last me for the whole term of my stay in Cumberland, if not for a much longer period. You don't say so, Mr. Hartwright. May I hear it? You have a claim to hear it. The chief person in the adventure was a total stranger to me, but may perhaps be a total stranger to you. But she certainly mentioned the name of the late Mrs. Fairley, in terms of the sincerest gratitude and regard. Mention my mother's name. You interest me indescribably. Pray go on. I at once related the circumstances under which I had met the woman in white, exactly as they had occurred, and I repeated what she had said to me about Mrs. Fairley and Limeridge House, word for word. Miss Halcombe's bright, resolute eyes looked eagerly into mine, from the beginning of the narrative to the end. Her face expressed vivid interest and astonishment, but nothing more. She was evidently as far from knowing any clue to the mystery as I was myself. "'Are you quite sure of those words referring to my mother?' she asked. "'Quite sure,' I replied. "'Whoever she may be, the woman was once at school in the village of Limeridge, was treated with especial kindness by Mrs. Fairley, and, in grateful remembrance of that kindness, feels an affectionate interest in all surviving members of the family. She knew that Mrs. Fairley and her husband were both dead, and spoke of Miss Fairley as if they had known each other when they were children. You said, I think, that she denied belonging to this place. Yes, she told me she came from Hampshire. And you entirely failed to find out her name? Entirely. Very strange. I think you're quite justified, Mr. Hartwright, in giving the poor creature her liberty, for she seems to have done nothing in your presence to show herself unfit to enjoy it. But I wish you'd been a little more resolute in finding out her name. We must really clear up this mystery in some way. You'd better not speak of it yet to Mr. Fairley or to my sister. They are both of them, I'm certain, quite as ignorant of who the woman is, or of what her past history in connection with us can be, as I am myself but they are also, in widely different ways, rather nervous and sensitive, and you'd only fidget one and alarm the other to no purpose. 
As for myself, I am all aflame with curiosity, and I devote my whole energies to the business of discovery from this moment. When my mother came here after her second marriage, she certainly established the village school just as it exists at the present time. But the old teachers are all dead, or gone elsewhere, and no enlightenment is to be hoped for from that quarter. The only other alternative I can think of— At this point we were interrupted by the entrance of a servant, with a message from Mr. Fairley, intimating that he would be glad to see me as soon as I had done breakfast. "'Wait in the hall,' said Miss Holcombe, answering the servant for me in her quick, ready way. Mr. Hartwright will come out directly. I was about to say, she went on, addressing me again, that my sister and I have a large collection of my mother's letters, addressed to my father and to hers. In the absence of any other means of getting information, I'll pass the morning in looking over my mother's correspondence with Mr. Fairley. He was fond of London, and was constantly away from his country home, and she was accustomed at such times to write and report to him how things went on at Limeridge. Her letters are full of references to the school in which she took so strong an interest, and I think it more than likely that I may have discovered something when we meet again. The luncheon hour is too, Mr. Hartwright. I shall have the pleasure of introducing you to my sister at that time, and we will occupy the afternoon in driving round the neighbourhood and showing you all our pet points of view. Till two o'clock, then. Farewell." She nodded to me with the lively grace, the delightful refinement of familiarity which characterised all that she did, and all that she said, and disappeared by a door at the lower end of the room. As soon as she had left me, I turned my steps towards the hall, followed the servant, on my way for the first time to the presence of Mr. Fairley. 7. My conductor led me upstairs into a passage which took us back to the bedchamber in which I had slept during the past night, and opening the door next to it begged me to look in. "'I have my master's orders to show you your own sitting-room, sir,' said the man, "'and to inquire if you approve of the situation and the light.' I must have been hard to please indeed if I had not approved of the room, and of everything about it. The bow-window looked out on the same lovely view which I had admired in the morning from my bedroom. The furniture was the perfection of luxury and beauty. The table in the centre was bright with gaily bound books, elegant conveniences for writing, and beautiful flowers. The second table near the window was covered with all the necessary materials for mounting water-colour drawings, and had a little easel attached to it, which I could expand or fold up at will. The walls were hung with gaily tinted chintz, and the floor was spread with Indian matting in maize colour and red. It was the prettiest and most luxurious little sitting-room I had ever seen, and I admired it with the warmest enthusiasm. The servant was far too highly trained to betray the slightest satisfaction. He bowed with icy deference when my terms of eulogy were all exhausted, and silently opened the door for me to go out into the passage again. We turned a corner and entered the long second passage ascended a short flight of stairs at the end, crossed a small circular upper hall, and stopped in front of a door covered with dark bays. The servant opened this door, and led me a few yards to a second, opened that also, and disclosed two curtains of pale sea-green silk hanging before us, raised one of them noiselessly, softly uttered the words, Mr. Hartwright, and left me. I found myself in a large lofty room with a magnificent carved ceiling, and with carpet all over the floor, so thick and soft that it felt like piles of velvet under my feet. One side of the room was occupied by a long bookcase of some rare inlaid wood that was quite new to me. It was not more than six feet high, and the top was adorned with statuettes in marble, ranged at regular distances one from the other. On the opposite side stood two antique cabinets, and between them and above them hung a picture of the Virgin and Child, protected by glass, and bearing Raphael's name, on the gilt tablet at the bottom of the frame. On my right hand, and on my left, as I stood inside the door, were chiffonier and little stands in bull and marquetry, loaded with figures in Dresden china, with rare vases, ivory ornaments, and toys and curiosities that sparkled at all points with gold, silver, and precious stones. At the lower end of the room opposite to me, the windows were concealed, and the sunlight was tempered by large blinds of the same pale sea-green colour as the curtains over the door. The light thus produced was deliciously soft, mysterious, and subdued. 
it fell equally upon all the objects in the room and it helped to intensify the deep silence and the air of profound seclusion that possessed the place and it surrounded with an appropriate halo of repose the solitary figure of the master of the house leaning back listlessly composed in a large easy chair with a reading easel fastened on one of its arms and a little table on the other if a man's personal appearance when he is out of his dressing room and when he has passed forty can be accepted as a safe guide to his time of life which is more than doubtful mr fairley's age when i saw him might have reasonably been computed as over fifty and under sixty years his beardless face was thin worn and transparently pale but not wrinkled his nose was high and hooked his eyes were of a dim greyish blue large prominent and rather red around the rims of the eyelids his hair was scanty soft to look at and of that light sandy colour which is the last to disclose its own changes towards grey he was dressed in a dark frock coat of some substance much thinner than cloth and in waistcoat and trousers of spotless white his feet were effeminately small and were clad in buff-coloured silk stockings and little womanish bronze leather slippers two rings adorned his white delicate hands the value of which even my inexperienced observation detected to be all but priceless upon the whole he had a frail languidly fretful over-refined look something singularly and unpleasantly delicate in its association with a man and at the same time something which could by no possibility have looked natural and appropriate if it had been transferred to the personal appearance of a woman my morning's experience with miss halcombe had predisposed me to be pleased with everybody in the house but my sympathies shut themselves up resolutely at the first sight of mr fairley on approaching nearer to him i discovered that he was not so entirely without occupation as i had first supposed placed amid the other rare and beautiful objects on a large round table near him was a dwarf cabinet in ebony and silver containing coins of all shapes and sizes set out in little drawers lined with dark purple velvet one of these drawers lay on the small table attached to his chair and near it were some tiny jeweller's brushes a wash leather stump and a little bottle of liquid all waiting to be used in various ways for the removal of any accidental impurities which might be discovered on the coins his frail white fingers were listlessly toying with something which looked to my uninstructed eyes like a dirty pewter medal with ragged edges when i advanced within a respectful distance of his chair and stopped to make my bow so glad to possess you at limeridge mr hartwright he said in a querulous croaking voice which combined in anything but an agreeable manner a discordantly high tone with a drowsily languid utterance pray sit down and don't trouble yourself to move the chair please in the wretched state of my nerves movement of any kind is exquisitely painful to me have you seen your studio will it do i've just come from seeing the room mr fairley and i assure you he stopped me in the middle of my sentence by closing his eyes and holding up one of his white hands imploringly i paused in astonishment and the croaking voice honoured me with this explanation pray excuse me and could you contrive to speak in a lower key in the wretched state of my nerves loud sound of any kind is indescribable torture to me you will pardon an invalid i only say to you that the lamentable state of my health obliges me to say to everybody yes and you really like the room i could wish for nothing prettier and nothing more comfortable i answered dropping my voice and beginning to discover already that mr fairley's selfish of affectation and mr fairley's wretched nerves meant one and the same thing so glad you will find your position here mr hartwright properly recognized there is none of the horrid english barbarity of feeling about the social position of an artist in this house so much of my early life has been passed abroad that i have quite cast my insular skin in that respect i wish i could say the same of the gentry detestable word but i suppose i must use it of the gentry in the neighbourhood they are sad goths in art mr hartwright people i do assure you who would have opened their eyes in astonishment if they had seen charles v pick up titian's brush for him do you mind putting this tray of coins back in the cabinet and giving me the next one to it 
in the wretched state of my nerves exertion of any kind is unspeakably disagreeable to me yes thank you as a practical commentary on the liberal social theory which he had just favoured me by illustrating mr fairley's cool request rather amused me i put back one drawer and gave him the other with all possible politeness he began trifling with the new set of coins and the little brushes immediately languidly looking at them and admiring them all the time he was speaking to me a thousand thanks and a thousand excuses do you like coins yes so glad we have another taste in common besides our taste for art now about the pecuniary arrangements between us do tell me are they satisfactory most satisfactory mr fairley so glad and what next ah i remember yes in reference to the consideration which you are good enough to accept for giving me the benefit of your accomplishment in art my steward will wait on you at the end of the first week to ascertain your wishes and what next curious is it not i had a great deal more to say and i appear to have quite forgotten it do you mind touching the bell in that corner yes thank you i rang and a new servant noiselessly made his appearance a foreigner with a set smile and perfectly brushed hair a valet every inch of him louis said mr fairley dreamily dusting the tips of his fingers with one of the tiny brushes for the coins i made some entries in my tablet this morning find my tablet a thousand pardons mr hartright i'm afraid to bore you as he wearily closed his eyes again before i could answer and as he did most assuredly bore me i sat silent and looked up at the madonna and child by raphael in the meantime the valet left the room and returned shortly with a little ivory book mr fairley after first relieving himself by a gentle sigh let the book drop open with one hand and held up the tiny brush with the other as a sign to the servant to wait for further orders yes just so said mr fairley consulting the tablet louis take down that portfolio he pointed as he spoke to several portfolios placed near the window on mahogany stands no no not the one with the green back that contains my rembrandt etchings mr hartright do you like etchings yes so glad we have another taste in common the portfolio with the red back louis don't drop it you have no idea of the tortures i should suffer mr hartright if lewis dropped that portfolio is it safe on the chair D do you think it safe mr hartright yes so glad will you oblige me by looking at the drawings if you really think they're quite safe louis go away what an ass you are don't you see me holding the tablet do you suppose i want to hold them then why not relieve me of the tablet without being told a thousand pardons mr hartright servants are such asses are they not do tell me what do you think of the drawings they have come from a sale in a shocking state i thought they smelt of horrid dealers and brokers fingers when i opened them last can you undertake them although my nerves were not as delicate enough to detect the odour of plebeian fingers which had offended mr fairley's nostrils my taste was sufficiently educated to enable me to appreciate the value of the drawings while I turned them over. They were, for the most part, really fine specimens of English watercolour art, and they had deserved much better treatment at the hands of their former possessor than they appeared to have received. The drawings, I answered, require careful straining and mounting, and in my opinion they are well worth— I beg your pardon, interposed Mr. Fairley. Do you mind my closing my eyes while you speak? Even this light is too much for them. Yes? I was about to say that the drawings are well worth all the time and trouble. Mr. Fairley suddenly opened his eyes again, rolled them with an expression of helpless alarm in the direction of the window. I entreat you to excuse me, Mr. Hartwright, he said in a feeble flutter, but, but surely I heard some horrid children in the garden. My private garden below? I can't say, Mr. Fairley, I heard nothing myself. Oblige me. You have been so very good in honouring my poor nerves. Oblige me by lifting the corner of the blind. Don't let the sun in on me, Mr. Hartwright. Have you got the blind up? Yes. Then will you be so very kind as to look into the garden and make quite sure? I complied with this new request. The garden was carefully walled in all around. Not a human creature, large or small, appeared in any part of the sacred seclusion. 
I reported that gratifying fact to Mr. Fairley. A thousand thanks, my fancy, I suppose. There are no children, thank heaven, in the house, but the servants, persons born without nerves, will encourage the children from the village, such brats. Oh, dear me, such brats! Shall I confess it, Mr. Hartwright, I sadly want a reform in the construction of children. Nature's only idea seems to be to make them machines for the production of incessant noise. Surely our delightful Raffaello's conception is infinitely preferable. He pointed to the picture of the Madonna, the upper part of which represented the conventional cherubs of Italian art, celestially provided with sitting accommodation for their chins, on balloons of buff-coloured cloud. "'Quite a model family,' said Mr. Fairley, leering at the cherubs. "'Such nice round faces, such nice soft wings, and nothing else. No dead little legs to run about on, no noisy little lungs to scream with. How immeasurably superior!' to the existing construction. I will close my eyes again, if you will allow me. And you really can manage the drawings? So glad! Is there anything else to settle? If there is, I think I have forgotten it. Shall we ring for Louis again?" Being by this time quite as anxious on my side as Mr. Fairley evidently was on his to bring the interview to a speedy conclusion, I thought that I would try to render the summoning of the servant unnecessary by offering the requisite suggestion of my own responsibility. The only point, Mr. Fairley, that remains to be discussed, I said, refers, I think, to the instruction in sketching which I am engaged to communicate to the two young ladies. Ah, just so. I wish I had felt strong enough to go into that part of the arrangement, but I don't. The ladies who profit by your kind services, Mr. Hartwright, must settle and decide and so on for themselves. My niece is fond of your charming art. She knows just enough about it to be conscious of our own sad defects. Please take pains with her. Yes. Is there anything else? No. We quite understand each other, don't we? I have no right to detain you any longer from your delightful pursuit, have I? So pleasant to have settled everything. Just a sensible relief to have done business. Do you mind ringing for Louis to carry the portfolio to your own room? I'll carry it there myself, Mr. Fairley, if you'll allow me. Will you really? Are you strong enough? How nice to be so strong! Are you sure you won't drop it? So glad to possess you at Limeridge, Mr. Hartwright. I'm such a sufferer that I hardly dare hope to enjoy much of your society. Would you mind taking great pains not to let the doors bang? And do not drop the portfolio? Thank you. Gently with the curtains, please. The slightest noise from them goes through me like a knife. Yes. Good morning. When the sea-green curtains were closed, and when the two bays doors were shut behind me, I stopped for a moment in the little circular hall beyond, and drew a long, luxurious breath of relief. It was like coming to the surface of the water after deep diving, to find myself once more on the outside of Mr. Fairley's room. As soon as I was comfortably established for the morning in my pretty little studio, the first resolution at which I arrived was to turn my steps no more in the direction of the apartments occupied by the master of the house except in the very improbable event of his honouring me with a special invitation to pay him another visit. Having settled this satisfactory plan of future conduct in reference to Mr. Fairley, I soon recovered the serenity of temper of which my employer's haughty familiarity and impudent politeness had for the moment deprived me. The remaining hours of the morning passed away pleasantly enough, in looking over the drawings, arranging them in sets, trimming their ragged edges, and accomplishing the other necessary preparations, in anticipation of the business of mounting them. I ought, perhaps, to have made more progress than this, but as the luncheon time drew near, I grew restless and unsettled, and felt unable to fix my attention on work, even though that work was only of the humble manual kind. At two o'clock I descended again to the breakfast-room, a little anxiously. Expectations of some interest were connected with my approaching reappearance in that part of the house, my introduction to Miss Fairley was now close at hand, and if Miss Halcombe's search through her mother's letters had produced the result which she anticipated, the time had come for clearing up the mystery of the woman in white. End of track two.